Without further ado, please, please, please give a warm welcome for Miss Michelle Mish Manners Mannering. Oh, that's a lot of M's, right? <laughs> uh, from GitHub, all right? Thank you so much. That was such a nice um, introduction. So thank you, thank you everyone. And it is, it is the afternoon. Oh, thank you, I've got my microphone now. It is the afternoon and I know I'm the second last session of the day. So thank you all for coming and taking time out and coming and listening to this presentation. So yes, it's on screen now. We are talking about Git, GitHub and gaming. Oh, I just, this is like a bit of a hazard up here. We can like hear it squeaking underneath me, but that's all good. So we're gonna look at open source and source control in the gaming industry. Who's a gamer in the house? Or I'm assuming everyone here is a gamer because you saw on the like on the speaker they're like game. I'm going to that talk because I'm a gamer and I want to be there. Um, so, but before we jump into that, I am on the GitHub Developer Relations team. This is our beautiful GitHub Developer Advocate here. I have some stickers of this, so if you want some stickers afterwards, see me. Um, you can follow GitHub on all the social media platforms, and you can also follow me as well. That's my Octocat, which you can also make your own Octocat as well, and I'll put a link up at the end to all the resources where you can actually build your own Octocat. So if you'd like to tweet or Instagram during the presentation, please do, and I will choose two really cool tweets that people tweet about my talk, and you can come and get some GitHub swag for me tomorrow at the booth. Swag that is not on the booth, by the way. This is my personal swag that I bought with me, so come along. So what are we actually gonna cover today in this Git, GitHub and gaming session? The first one, I'm just really briefly just gonna go over Git, just to set the scene. We're not gonna talk too much about that. Talk a little bit about collaboration and what I love about collaboration and talk really briefly about GitHub, just making sure you all know what GitHub is. Um, the, we're gonna spend most of the presentation talking about this source control and gaming, which is gonna be really fun. Talk about some open source game engines and then finish up on how to actually get involved in gaming. Not as a gamer, because you're all gamers here, you're all involved in gaming, um, but how to get involved as a game developer, because a lot of people think that's quite fun. So really briefly, what is Git? Git is a distributed version control system. Who's been using Git in the house? Pretty much everyone, fantastic, I don't have to go over this too much. But most of you would be very like, familiar with this if you're using Git. Obviously, it's a, um, a system that allows you to have a file, has all the versions of um, the different history of that file within the same system. Obviously, then a, a distributed version control is we have the same file and the same versions of the file and all that history saved on everyone's system, right? So we can all access it and it's all really fun and it's really good and when this happens, everyone is happy, yay. Now the reason this is important is because it is a piece on collaboration. Now I do an entirely other talk that takes about an hour on collaboration and why it's awesome and fun. Now I'm not gonna have time to go into this today, but the reason collaboration is so important, yes, it's been around for pretty much forever, but collaboration is really important because when we collaborate with other people, whether it's within our own team, whether it's in an open source environment, we actually build better products and services for our customers or our clients. That is because we are taking the collective knowledge of the team. Now, if I build something myself, thank you for introducing me as the queen and the, the master of all. I'm really not though. Whereas if I built something with everyone in this room, the thing we build is probably gonna be a lot better than the thing I built by myself because I'm able to draw on all the knowledge and experience of everyone else in the room. And then it becomes this group effort. So that's why I think collaboration is really important. It is also, in fact, a, a um, pillar of DevOps, which is interesting. Again, not gonna go into that today. But why I think it's really important here, if we have like four different teams, this is really fun. Um, if we all just work within our own little team, so say we've got an engineering team, a marketing team, a sales team, and a management team here. If we all work in our own little individual teams, the development team builds what they want. The marketing team is talking about something that the development team hasn't actually built because they don't really know what they're building because they never collaborated with. The sales team is selling something that the marketing team aren't talking about and not even something that is a product because they never talk to either team. And the management team is sitting there going, ah, what's actually happening? Because if we're not collaborating, we're not talking, we don't actually build things that are right for our customers. We don't understand what the rest of the company is doing. We don't understand how our role fits into these other teams. So the way it works now is we have a lot more people collaborating across cultures, across disciplines, which is really awesome. And obviously there's more lines than that, but you know, for sake of lines going all over the screen, there's just two. Um, and we know that today, there's usually something that sits in the middle here to help with this collaboration. Um, a lot of that is, at times, is GitHub. You know, GitHub is a collaboration tool. If 
Everyone use GitHub in the room? Pretty much everyone? Yeah, cool. We now have 100 million developers on GitHub, which is amazing. And it has now become the place not just to store your Git repository, because that's originally what it was built for, a place to store your Git repository. You know, back to that distributed version control. It's now a place that we can all collaborate together on these things. So GitHub itself has become a place of collaboration. And in fact, we have a lot of tools for collaborating on GitHub, not just developers collaborating, but also non-developers collaborating as well. And unfortunately, I don't have time to actually go through most of these tools today, but these are some of the things you can do. Now, as a developer, you, or probably a lot of you in the room would know about you know, the code review and things like that, but there's so many other things here that you can use to collaborate on your projects on GitHub. And if you have a look at some of them, for example, projects and documentation, those things aren't developer specific. You don't need to know code to read a project board. You don't need to know code to read the documentation. Now, obviously, if it's a bit more technical, you kind of need to have technical background. But by using some of these things, we can actually have developers and non-developers working together on their platforms, which is fun. Now, GitHub was originally, well, not originally, originally, but it, in the early days of GitHub, we became known as the social coding platform. That's that platform you go to build code with other people. Now, this is obviously, again, not just a place to store repositories, but to collaborate with others. And something that it has now become the home of as well is obviously source control and open source. Now, source control, who's using source control? Who's using GitHub in the room? Pretty much everyone. Everyone using it for like work? Everyone using it for like not work as well? Yeah, right. Most people are using source control. It's really important. And it's become pretty much like so many companies are using it. But it is basically standard across the tech industry. How often have you gone to someone and said, oh, what do you use for your source control? And they're like, what, what do you mean our source control? Like, everyone has some sort of source control. If they're not using GitHub, they're using something else, right? Source control is really, really important. But yes, it's standard across the tech industry, but what about when it comes to gaming? Gaming is very different, right? Gaming isn't just tech. It involves tech, but it's not only tech. And source control, when it comes to gaming, there's a lot of issues. Has anyone tried to do source control in game development? Yeah, and you're sitting there going, ah, you should have seen it. Well, I was probably in a similar boat to you. I did this thing a couple of years ago during the pandemic, so I thought it was a great idea. And I built this little micro game using um, Unity, which is an obvious choice for a game engine, usually Unity or Unreal. And I built this, this mini game engine. They had a lot of things out there already. Um, and so I, I didn't have to build it from scratch. I can build on top of it. But you know, this is my repository on GitHub, and I came across so many issues when it came to the source control. Because I'd done some projects before, you know, done some stuff during Hacktoberfest, built my own like little projects, and you know, it was relatively easy. I'd come up against um, you know, some merge conflicts in the past, but you get through them. I came up against so many more issues when it came to you know, doing this source control in these games. Now, one of the first things you'll come up against if you're trying to do source control on um, any type of video gaming is one of the first things is the file types, right? So this is my repository here. We can see here that there's like different files, like there's, there's these proj files, which is a um, Premiere um, Pro Adobe project file. You know, there's a lot of JPEGs, there's some videos. Now we know when it comes to Git and source control in development in like normal tech terms, Git is really good at handling code because code is a text file and it's relatively small, right? Whereas here, where you're already seeing that there's so many other things other than code in here, other than text in here. Now, GitHub has gotten a lot better at actually um, showing a lot of these things now, which is really, really great. Um, but, you know, we actually have some problems. Now, if we have a look at this, who's into Final Fantasy? Are you people Final Fantasy fans? This, like, is, is a game that requires a lot of cutscenes. The assets required for this are massive. Now, this is like almost cinema quality, which is you know, great. Has anyone, everyone played this? Don't worry, I don't go too far into this. So if anyone hasn't played it, there's no spoilers in here. But you know, this type of asset is massive, and it's not a text file. It was not bin it's binary, it's ones and zeros. It's not like and, and other numbers too, but it's not a text file. So it's really hard. Has anyone done video editing in the room? I know there's French down. Anyone done something? Yeah, 
Have you ever done just one version of your file and saved it and exported it? No, you haven't, right? And same with this. Have you seen any behind the scenes or anything like that? These people creating these, these artists and designers, they have more than one version of the, the asset that they're creating. Now, how do they do source control on that? We'll come back to that. The other thing they have, um, for example, like behind the scenes and things, like something that's really big in game development and in movies and things like that, is these concept pieces of artwork. Now, this is a big process, a big part of the process of actually creating games. And even before this, they go into like sketchboards and even clay models and things. How do you do source control on this? Interesting, right? But also, these things here, now this is some concept art from um, Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom, if anyone started playing it yet. This doesn't actually end up in the final version of the game. Like, yes, there's something similar to it, but, like, but you don't see those little, you know, the strings from his shoes. That isn't its own thing in a game. It's attached to other things. So while these things don't end up in the game, they end up in things like promo posters and art books and things like that. But again, how do you do source control on this kind of stuff? Where does, it, where does it get stored? How do we like manage all these assets? The next thing we come up against, and something you might have already noticed or already thought about with this file type, is then the file size. Now, this is like you know, the, the big problem when it comes to file sizes and these kind of things, especially like you know, the Final Fantasy one. A lot of the assets used in gaming, especially now, they're 4K, 8K assets. They're big files that are just really, really large. Now, if we have a look here, this is my, um, my repository again. If we go into this video trailer, uh, it says can't show on GitHub. Now, that's obviously a limitation of GitHub. I think we can now show videos up to like 10 megabytes, like embedded in the file. But that video was like only 57 megabytes, which really isn't that big. That um, the Final Fantasy, that, that wasn't a video, that was a GIF that I just showed you on the screen. That was 170 megabytes, that GIF. Like that's just like a bit insane, right? Like the fact that these files are just so big. Some of you who are sitting there who might have done video game are like, well, but there's the Git large file system storage or LFS. Like, sure, we've got it, it's, it's, it's there, but it's, it's not perfect, right? There's so many like, limitations there. But like, how do we deal with these massive big things? Um, now, this is me trying to work on this project in Australia as well, if anyone's heard of that little island down, the, yep, down there. The internet's terrible. So trying to like, you know, upload these files, download, you know, there's issues there too. So like, you know, it, I actually had a little bit of a nightmare and it kind of put me off a little bit. Um, doing some of these kind of things. But let's compare this for a second. So this is my repository here. Um, and if we have a look at this, it's, you know, there's some different file sizes, but let's compare it to something like code. So the GitHub code base. Now I'm not talking about all the code available on GitHub. I'm talking about the code that powers GitHub. The entire code base that powers GitHub is 11 gigabytes. It is one of the biggest code bases on the planet and it's still only 11 gigabytes. Now, you've done some video editing, other people have done some video editing in the room. You'll know that 11 gigabytes in terms of videos is either one video, if you've recorded it like a complete lossless, or it's only a couple of videos. Like, that's not very big as a file base. Let's compare it again to some, some other games you might have played in terms of like the size. Anyone played Forza here, Forza Horizon? A couple of people. I downloaded this, again, very, very slowly on my Australian internet. This on disk size is 158 gigabytes. That's huge. That's without the expansions. Like, these games are, like, quite, quite large. Um, do you all have, like, um, it's not really a big thing here in America, but, like, cereal boxes and stuff? I remember, like, in the 90s, I opened up a cereal packet and I got this cool game called Age of Empires, came out of a cereal box um, on a disk. Did that happen here? In America, it did. Yeah, so this game, it came on a disc, right? A physical disc. That game on your computer took up 80 megabytes. That's all that game took up. It required a Pentium 90 processor to run it, and you had to have a minimum of 16 megabytes of RAM. Now, obviously, I could go back further and talk about you know, some of the DOS games being like even smaller, but you know, now that 
they've decided to remaster this game. Yay, let's take this game that everyone loves and remaster it. Fantastic. This is great. Now, the reason why it came on a disc is because it was so small. No discs available anymore because this game is so big. This game downloaded on your computer, if you want to experience it in 4K ultra high definition, is 218 gigabytes on your disk, you basically need an entirely separate SSD to run this game now, when we used to get it out of a serial packet, right? So these things are just really, really big. Again, how do we do source control on this kind of stuff? The other problem when it comes to video gaming is not just the file type, the file size, but actually the sheer number of files required to actually run a game. Not just to run a game, but to build the game as well. So again, let's just take a look at my little micro game here. So if we have a look and we open it up. This is downloaded onto my local computer when I looked at this. So you can look at some of the types of files here again if you need to. But this is, again, this is a micro game. This isn't one of those big AAA Final Fantasy Forza games. If we have a look at the properties on this, you can see there, there are 17,000 files, or over 17,000 files on 750 folders. Like, that is a lot of files. Um, and I did actually, in fact, use the Git large file system storage thing to try and help with this. It kicked a fuss so many times because I just couldn't quite understand either, you know, the type of asset I was loading or like it like ignores half of the files as well that you're using in Unity, so it's a bit crazy. So not only are these like a sheer number of files, it's because some of these files are actually quite tiny. So any Pokemon fans in the room, sprites. You know, these are tiny little files. You need hundreds of them, like so many of them. You need install files, map data, dependencies, all these things to run these games. Let's have a look at, I'm also an Elder Scrolls fan, so this is Elder Scrolls downloaded on my computer. So you'll see here there's so many different types of files and like file types and they're all small. Everything from text files to settings and data and XML and launches and all these things that like when we're talking about code, or like, you know, specifically code bases, we don't need a lot of these things to actually run something. Whereas when we it comes to gaming, it's, it's a bit of a problem. The final problem I want to talk about, and please don't take this the wrong way, because I'm going to talk about it, you know, in a fun way, is non-developers. Now, non-developers obviously aren't a problem. Now, we really need non-developers when it comes to gaming. Um, now, obviously, we have some non-developers here. This is from um, League of Legends Arcane. And we obviously have lots of artists, designers, creators, types, you know, when it comes to gaming. Now, a lot of people see it as a problem, quote unquote, because non-developers don't know how to use GitHub or don't know how to use source control, and they're not technical. Now, we know that that, in its sense, is not exactly 100% correct. And as I mentioned, I have a whole other talk that I go into about developers and non-developers working better together. But this, to me, is not really a technical problem. This is a cultural problem, a cultural issue. So I'm still going to like mention it as a, as a problem, um, but it's not really a problem. And again, coming back to that idea of teamwork that I mentioned before, teamwork is really important to collaborate across to make sure that everyone's voices are heard to ensure that like different opinions, like I come from a non-developer background working in a developer advocacy team and my teammates often say to me like we really value the way that you read your tutorials and things like that because you tell us like hey you've missed a step here because as senior developers they just assume that somebody knows about this particular thing or where to find this thing. So, you know, everyone has these unique insights and, and things like that. I learn a lot from the senior developers in the team and things like that. So teamwork's really important. Multidisciplinary work's really important. So let's just have a really quick look at these again. So these are the issues, right, when it comes to source control and gaming. And as I put there, this shouldn't actually be an issue, this last one. Again, more of a cultural issue rather than a technical issue. But despite a lot of these issues when it comes to source control and gaming, we actually have a lot of big industry using GitHub. Now, these are all uh, GitHub customers. Like all, these, all these companies use GitHub. Granted, a lot of them don't all use it to actually do source control on their video games because a lot of the reasons I mentioned, but a lot of them are still using these kind, like are using GitHub. They're actively using it, right? So that to me says, well, there's got to be a better way to actually, you know, do some of this stuff. 
Now, I have a lot of friends working um, not just in these big AAA companies, but in other game development companies as well. And I spoke to them and I was like, hey, you're a game developer, you actually build games as a living, like, what do you use for your source control? And when I asked them, they came back with two main, two main answers. The first one, source control what? Like, like what, what do you mean? We, we don't do source control. And I was like, what, what do you do? And they're like, well, we save the thing on the, on the disk, and then when we need to, we either override it or we save a new version of it. And I was like, how does everyone? They're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, so that's the first problem is most of them don't actually use it or some of the really, really big AAA studios have built their own in-house source control systems to be able to do these things for their games. Now, these are very custom, they're very specific, and I was like, well, can't you kind of like share these things? They're like, they're not perfect. They don't always work. So these are kind of some issues that, that, that kind of need to be solved in gaming, and we're not going to solve them in the next five minutes of this talk. So what I did want to talk about and kind of leave you with is actually what, what can you do if you want to actually get involved um, in game development. And I would encourage you, a lot, a lot of you in the room, you're all gamers. Um, it seems like all of you use GitHub and you're all you know, technical as well. You know, build, like, give it a go. Like, yes, it's a bit hard, right? And you, know, you get, come up with some, you know, ah, pulling your hair out at night sometimes. But if you like, are passionate about this and you want to do it, give it a go. And as you're going through that, like understand some of the limitations and issues you're having, and then hopefully as we all work together, we can collectively try and solve this. Now, again, we're not gonna solve this right now. And also, if you don't wanna solve it, because some people are like, but I just wanna like work on games, I actually wanna solve the big issues, because that's obviously gonna help out the big AAA companies, and I wanna do other things. Um, you can have a look at some of the open source um, aspects of gaming. So there are a bunch of open source game engines, which is a really cool. Now these open source game engines means that you can either like take them and use them, or you can contribute to them. So here's a, a few of them on the screen here. So if you're into um, JavaScript, have a look at Phaser or um, Sprig. If you're into C++ or you know Godot, so check out some of these. They're really fun. There's obviously Unity and Unreal. They're not necessarily open source, but they are free game engines. I use Unity to build um, the, you know, the Lego micro game that I showed you before. But you know, these are really good to get involved in, especially if you're, you know, JavaScript and Python are obviously really um, popular coding languages. So there's a lot of people who work on these types of things. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun, and a lot of these game engines are designed to help you build micro games. So when you're building the micro game, like the one that I showed you, you come up against a lot less issues than you obviously do in those big AAA games. So you, know, you saw that I, I, yes, I had a headache doing it, but it is possible to do source control on like smaller games. The next one is to have a look at some of the game jams around. Who's done a game jam before? A couple, yes, hackathons, anyone done a hackathon? More people done hackathons. If, you're, if you enjoyed hackathons and you want to get involved in game dev or like, you know, just have some eyes on something a little bit different, game jams are super fun. You get to build a game in like a short amount of time. You get to work with other people. It's really fun. So one of the things that we have every year, we do the GitHub game off. Now this is a very open game jam. You can build anything you like for any platform using any open or any game engine basically. You're not limited to anything. So some people, you know, build things in Unity, Godot, they build things for mobile. I had someone build something for Switch one year, which was really cool. Um, so we run this every year. The only criteria is you have to stick to the theme. And there's a cool theme every year, which is great. Um, the other thing is there's plenty of other game jams out there. There's a global game jam that just happened um, relatively recently. Um, JS13K Games is a really interesting and a really fun one. So has anyone heard of JS13K Games? Yes, there's one per couple of people. Cool. Um, it comes from a guy in Poland. He's actually a GitHub star. And you have to use HTML and JavaScript, and you have to build a game that is less than 13 kilobytes. And I have, I judge this, I don't, I don't get involved in this, I judge it, and I have been blown away what people are able to build in 13 kilobytes or less. You're like, how did you, like you've got music and assets and like all these kind of stuff, and it actually really makes you think about the type, you know, obviously when you're doing a lot of like 
other game data. You're not limited by file size, right? So you're like, I must make it as big as possible. Whereas when you're like, you have a limitation like this, it really makes you creative and think like, okay, wh what do I not need? What can I make small? What can I reference in other places? It's really quite exciting. The other thing we've noticed with GitHub is there's quite a lot of activity happening around gaming on GitHub, whether they're open source game engines, people building games and putting up their, you know, their games on GitHub. So what we've decided to do now is we have this new thing called Git, um, Game Bytes. And it's a monthly blog that we have, and we do a roundup of cool new games that people have built um, using open source, or that maybe they have it on GitHub. We talk about some of the latest game engines and open source things. We talk about the latest game jams, so if you want to know if there's a game jam coming up. So check that out. It's really, really cool. Now, I did promise you at the start that uh, I would put up a link to all the resources for this talk. So if you scan that QR code, or you can wait until like five minutes after the presentation and then there's an automatic tweet going out with this QR code. And it has the links to all these things I've just mentioned, like you know, creating your Octocat, uh, checking out GitHub Game Bytes and things like that. So unfortunately, we obviously don't have time for questions, but there is a question room over there, so I'll be heading over there. Or you can actually ask me a question on pretty much every social media platform known to man, as I mentioned. And I have six seconds left on the clock. So thank you all so much for being here and listening to my talk. And I hope you all get involved in game dev.